Hello and welcome back to Think 301 Introduction to Business Finance. We are on session 7 today and we're going to look at cash and marketable securities. Now this is partly in continuation of session 6 that looked at working capital management. But in business, cash is king, so we're going to devote a significant portion of some of our sessions from now and beyond to how to manage cash. Because in as much as a business may be very successful, the absence of cash could be the very reason why a business goes out on the streets or goes insolvent. Not because the business idea is bad, not because the business is not well wealthy, but because it hasn't got cash to move things around. So cash is a very crucial component of every business. So we are going to learn how to manage cash. And we do so by learning to identify the various needs that a firm will have and plan for that accordingly. It is also important to know that, yes, cash also has its pros and cons. So we need to know available market securities that we can choose from in our need to invest cash temporarily when we have excess. And then we can liquidate them when we do not have enough to pay up our bills. Now, at the end of the session, we are trying to get students to understand the motives for holding money, be able to undertake effective and efficient cash management, apply models of cash management, and identify various marketable securities available for use in their cash and securities management. For our session, we're going to be looking at cash management in general, the BAT model, which is a model for determining optimal cash levels to hold, and also we're going to look at marketable securities. Now, the goal of cash management is to obtain the highest possible return on cash, for which reason we look at the components of cash, which is the petty cash, cash on hand, and then cash at the bank. Now, now let's look at what it means for holding cash. When you have to hold cash, there are a number of reasons why you have to hold cash. First, we have the transaction motive. And for this transaction motive, it is the motive for which we hold cash for our basic or our day-to-day -day transactions. So for whatever transactions a business undertakes over a period of time, this is one motive to hold enough cash to be able to pay up. Then we also have a precautionary motive for holding cash. Now this is a case of holding cash in case of emergencies. Now, this is also very important in the life of any business because not having money on hand to take up or to handle any emergency situation could very well make the difference between a firm that goes bankrupt or has serious issues versus a firm that stays profitable and stable over time. We also have another motive for holding on to cash, and that is for the speculative motive. Now, this motive intrinsically has to deal with the idea that good deals may come on unexpectedly and a firm that has enough cash on hand could easily take advantage of that. That could be that you could get to buy a machine at a reduced price, etc. So now these are the reasons for holding cash. Now if you look at these reasons for holding cash, which is the transaction motive, the precautionary motive and the speculative motive, there is the tendency or the temptation that a firm is likely to have a very huge cash balance at any point in time. Now the risk is that even though there may be advantages to holding cash, which is like it enables the firm to take advantage of discounts, which we dealt with in the previous session, and it helps the firm to maintain its credit rating because it doesn't go bad on its credit payments, and it also helps firm to take advantage of favorable business opportunities or help to meet emergencies, cash is one of the assets that can be quite costly in that when you hold cash, you forgo interest on the cash. And so there's a possibility that in terms of instead of holding so much cash, a firm must find the balance between its cash needs and the available returns it can make by putting the cash in an investment. Now, that aside, then the firm must also look at the fact that because of the risk of running into cash shortages, which could have very dire consequences for the firm, the firm can employ some methods to ease sh such shortages, and that could be to try and postpone capital expenditure where it is possible. It could also try to accelerate cash inflows by pressing debtors for earlier payment, and in some cases, it could revise past investment decisions and sell off assets that were previously acquired if they are no longer useful. 
Now, these are ways of ensuring that at, at any point in time, the, ca the firm has enough cash on hand to handle its day-to-day -day activities and be in good standing. Now, another way of easing your cash rigidities or the potential cash crisis is to negotiate reduction in cash outflows. Now, this may mean that you'd want to take longer credit from your suppliers. Bear in mind that taking longer credit from them may come at a cost, so you would have to weigh this in line with the cost of taking credit from suppliers in order to proceed. You could also reschedule loan repayments, you could defer tax payments, or you could reduce your dividend payments. All these have the potential to reduce cash outflows and thus minimize the potential of going into a liquidity crisis. Now, as I mentioned earlier, holding on to cash has got a number of costs. Now, let's look at the scenario in this format. A firm at any point in time will need cash for the purposes of daily transactions to meet emergencies or to take advantage of a unique opportunity. However, holding a lot of cash means that you forego the interest that you could have earned if the money had been in an investment account. Now, that we refer to as opportunity cost. That's the invest income foregone when we hold on to cash. On the other hand, a firm that decides to transfer all of its inv money into investments is likely to always have to visit the bank or the financial institutions to liquidate the investment into actual cash for use. Now, that comes also with trading costs, which is normally considered fixed. So if you look closely at the graph we have on the board, it means that whenever your cash balances increase, the opportunity cost goes up. But at the same time, it minimizes your trading cost because you do not have to constantly go back to your financial institution to liquidate your assets or your short-term assets into actual cash for use. On the other hand, when you keep very minimal cash on hand, you consistently have to incur high trading costs in terms of the, what it will cost you to liquidate those investments into actual cash for use. Now, the optimal point, which is the best point for reduced total cost of holding cash, is where the trading cost or the transaction cost for liquidating your funds and opportunity cost, which is the interest for going, where they cross over. Once they cross over, that's the minimum point, and that, according to the BAT model, becomes the optimal cash level. So that holding that volume of cash usually presents a balance between interest for gone and also minimizes one's trading cost. Now, let's put that. So here, this is a graphical representation. Now, using the BAT model, which is similar to the EOQ model we handled earlier in inventory management, a firm, once it carries in, um, cash, forgoes interest. So the carrying cost is the lost interest divided by two gives you the average cost for forgoing the holding on to cash instead of having an investment. Whereas on the flip side also, we have the case where the total volume of cash needed for the year divided by the frequency with which we have to visit the bank to convert that into actual cash for use gives us the, free, um, the total number of visits to our financial institutions multiplied by the trading charge or the trading fee gives us the total trading cost. Now, looking at the graph where the two crossover, it means that the point that there's an optimal point where the two cross is where, therefore, we look at our total cash cost or cost of holding cash, which is the average holding cost and then the total trading cost. When we put all two together and we net off, at the point where there's an optimal cash balance, it means our opportunity cost for gone and our trading cost meet up. When we solve for that, our optimal cash balance is given by a formula that is similar to the EOQ model where we have two multiplied by the total funds needed for the year, multiplied by the fixed cost of converting securities into cash, divided by the interest that we forego whenever we have to transmit or hold on to cash instead of holding on to assets. Now, there's an example where we have where Equia has a number, uh, an amount of funds per day, the interest rate and the fixed cost to convert and so we compute and then we realize that the optimal cash balance 
for her at any point in time when she needs to withdraw money is 9,552. So it means that whenever she has to go to the bank, this amount of money will ensure that she doesn't lose too much interest, but at the same time doesn't do multiple visits to the bank, which will translate into high trading costs. Now, once we have excess money, there's a need to put it away. However, we need to only put it away in short-term investments, typically because putting them in long-term investments means you're going to run into the risk of illiquidity, meaning we would not have enough cash to be able to pay up our recurring debt obligations. So an avenue for putting excess cash is into marketable securities. Now, before a firm would seriously consider which marketable securities to look at, it has to consider the following considerations. The first we look at is financial risk. Now, this has to do with the uncertainty of the return due to the issuer's ability to pay. In essence, you need to be sure that wherever you are putting the money has got the propensity to pay. So in this regard, for a number of cases, T-bill sometimes presents one of the best options because the security is on the state's treasury, for which reason ability to pay is almost guaranteed. Then you have to make also look at the consideration in relation to interest rate risk. That is, would interest rates be changing over time? And if so, what is the impact? Is it going to go up or down? And if it's so, what would be the reflection on the value of your investment? So whatever be the case, the risk that changes in interest rate can affect the returns or the price of an investment should be seriously considered before one puts up money in any investment. Another thing is to be able to look at liquidity. Now, since these investments are being made specifically to ensure that as and when the firm needs cash, it's able to sell off and then raise cash, one of the key considerations should also be the liquidity of the instruments being um, looked at. Because an illiquid instrument, which is a, an instrument that is difficult to sell off or an instrument that has to be priced so low in order to sell, hence resulting in a significant loss in value, it is, is not an option as far as investment in marketable securities are concerned. And also the issue of taxability. For what reasons, the, how much tax is going to be applied on that investment also plays a role in the net returns that can be made. And so this needs to be considered seriously. And also the yield, which to a large extent in totality is influenced by the four uh, previous considerations we've looked at, that is taxability, liquidity, interest rate risk, and the financial risk of the institution. Now, let's look at some types of marketable securities that a firm may want to um, take up when it has excess cash. Now, one of them could be treasury bills. These are usually short-term securities issued by the government. Like I mentioned earlier, these are usually one of the safest investment uh, vehicles that an institution can use. Now, we also have bankers' acceptances. These are short-term securities normally used in international trade and can be sold on discounts on the secondary market. And then we have negotiable certificates of deposit. These are short-term securities issued by banks more in the realm of fixed uh, deposits and extra. Then we also have commercial papers. Now, these are typically short-term unsecured IOUs that are sold by reputable firms to raise cash, normally having a lifespan of about up to 270 days. And then there's also the need or the possibility of doing repurchase agreements where you can acquire, when you do have short-term investments and you need cash, what you do is to transfer ownership of those short-term investments to um, a sister firm who gives you cash to um, pursue whatever agenda you have and at a set date, you repurchase the securities and then you pay for them. So those are some of the types of marketable securities available. And then there's also the mutual fund, which is typically the pool of a number of marketable securities that are normally divided into shares and are sold to investors. Now this provides a platform where for very small amounts, you could actually diversify the base because since it's a collection of numerous marketable securities, at any point in time, the exposure to only one 
and for that reason the financial risk the interest risk risk and the taxability issues are significantly minimized now that brings us to the end of the session on cash management and marketable securities management i hope to see you in the next session thank you